Hello, so uh, I'm going to kickstart our presentation. My name is Jenny Kidd and I'm a lecturer at the School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies at Cardiff University. And I'm here today with Alison John from Yellow Brick. Do you want to say a little oh, bit about that, what you do? Well, that's, that's fine. Okay. A great introduction. introduction for Yellow Brick. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and we're also here talking on behalf of Sarah Hughes as well, who's a digital project um, content officer sorry, at Amgworth for Cymru National Museum, Wales. So the project that we want to talk to you about, so the project we want to talk to you about this afternoon then is Traces, Oleon in the Welsh language. This is a subtle map that we recently launched that encourages visitors to experience the St Fagans National History Museum in a new way. Who here is familiar with St Fagans National History Museum? Okay, so a fair few people in the room. Um, so Alison's going to say a little bit more about the app itself and its development and the partnership work that's underpinned this project in a moment. But first what I want to do is to offer some background on our ambitions <clears throat> with this project. So this project follows on from some prior partnership work that we've been doing. Ali and I have been working together in collaboration also with the museum since 2013. And what we've been doing over the course of a number of iterations of this work has been to trial new approaches to immersive storytelling, um, specifically within the context of National Museum Wales sites. Um, okay, so what do we mean when we talk about immersive storytelling? You'll have heard this word immersive used a number of times over the course of the day, and you might have your own understandings uh, of that term and your own interpretations of that term. But what we mean when we talk about immersive storytelling is uh, experiences that are audience-centred in the first instance, experiences that attempt to arouse people's senses, that attempt to engage them emotionally, that are attuned to the environments within which they are created and within which they operate, and that facilitate a move from storytelling to story living, which sounds a little bit cheesy, but, um, but go with this. So immersive storytelling then for museums has gained a lot of interest on the, num on the back of, I would say, a number of trends, and we're hearing more about these trends today. Uh, trends such as the uh, increased turn towards narrative within our institutions, a kind of a narrative turn. So we've uh, now got a whole range of different approaches to digital storytelling within museums, many of which have actually been quite extensive now. So projects like uh, a couple of years ago now, the Culture Shock Programme by Tyne and Weir Museums, or the work uh, of Welcome Collection on their digital storytelling projects. These are the creation of you know, multiple narratives for different sites, not narratives often that are playful, uh, and sometimes narratives that are not to be trusted, and we think this is all really quite enticing and intriguing. So we've seen this kind of narrative turn within institutions. We've also seen a ludic turn within museums, by which I mean an increased interest, as we've just been hearing, in play, game mechanics. Um, uh, so, you know, hearing about the escape room and how it's been built to kind of, you know, trial and, uh, and uh, explore game mechanics. And we've also seen uh, across the museums and heritage sector as well, an effective turn in, uh, in these institutions as well. So that is, we are also interested now in thinking about how museums and heritage sites might make us feel and engaging with uh, those feelings, thinking about how those feelings maybe can translate into real world actions as well. So, um, so you know, all of this kind of underpins the, the work that we've been trying to do here. Um, that effective turn uh, also manifests in things like the Happy Museum Project and the Empathy Museum Project. Um, so, so we kind of see what we're doing as kind of situated um, around those kind of, you know, those three trends, the narrative turn, the ludic turn, and the effective turn within these institutions. And um, we've also seen kind of allied to all of that then, <clears throat> a drive by museums, sorry, frog in the throat. Uh, a drive by museums to better ex uh, position themselves <clears throat> within what has been termed uh, not um, without criticism, of course, the experience economy. So this is one where people are increasingly willing, it seems anyway, to pay for cultural encounters that are out of the ordinary. So things like the escape rooms um, phenomena, street games, secret cinema, and the like. Okay, so given all of that context then, we've been increasingly interested in a number of questions. So questions such as what kinds of story worlds can we build in and around museums? 
How closely tethered do those story worlds need to be to the other kinds of stories that are being told or interpreted on site? What kinds of ethical considerations should inform the story worlds that we build? And how do we make sure that the story worlds we build are accessible? So in our case, uh, working with the National Museum Wales, of course, we needed to think about how this experience or the number of experiences that we've built would be accessible in the Welsh language. But also we need to think about accessibility much more broadly than that. And so to think about perhaps others who might traditionally be alienated by immersive experiences. And then another question that I think is really interesting in this context is that question of what can't immersive storytelling, sorry, <coughs> What can't immersive storytelling do? What might it be its limitations as well? As well? Okay, so um, we think that against what is often a kind of quite noisy backdrop of investment in virtual reality experiences and uh, augmented reality experiences, for example, um, there are a number of really, really interesting projects that are exploring actually much uh, more subtle and quieter and more intimate um, ways of imagining um, immersive storytelling. Ways that are kind of, you know, less tech driven, if you like, and much more kind of narrative driven, less obvious. And so we're looking at projects like the Lost Palace project, uh, historic royal palaces, Chonko and Rosie are an, an invited guest. Any, anybody here do the Lost Palace experience? Okay, so a number of people. Um, so uh, a really interesting way of thinking about immersive st storytelling and what it might be able to achieve in these contexts. Um, Ghosts in the Garden, another one, Holborn Museum, Splash and Ripple, and Steve Poole at the University of West of England. Um, a Hollow Body, another one, the Museum of London and Circumstance. Uh, and I kind of you know, nod to all of those projects because um, looking at what's happening with those is kind of informing the way that we're thinking about all of this. And also, I think it's interesting to note that most of those other projects um, are also, like ours, quite extensive partnership projects, uh, which seems um, interesting given the context of this uh, conference. So the precursor to the project traces that we're here to talk about today was a project called With New Eyes I See. Uh, this was a project where we were able to begin to test our ideas around immersive storytelling and what it might be able to um, uh, do in order to kind of, you know, liberate the archives of the National Museum Wales. And we also wanted to test through this kind of first iteration of the project what participants' appetites might be for this kind of storytelling and these kinds of experiences in our locality. So with New Eyes I See was funded via a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council's REACT project, and it involved us putting on a timed event in the park outside National Museum in Cardiff uh, at night, um, so it was you know, in the dark. It was using projections, it used a soundscape, and people worked in groups in the park in order to piece together a narrative, to kind of cohere a narrative from the fragments that they found within that space. Uh, we've written about that project elsewhere, and I can tweet a, a link to all of that, but what we found with that work was that respondents, um, people who came along and who, uh, who spoke to us about this experience, really evidenced a, a desire for more of that kind of practice, they liked this kind of sense of mystery. They liked the tension. They liked the sociality of the experience. They liked the kind of quite fine line that we were walking in that project between fact and fiction. And what we found was that people in, uh, in participating in that project actually were performing their visitation to that museum encounter very differently than they might perform their visitation within other kinds of museum encounter. And uh, that was really intriguing to us. So their, their visitation was, you know, uh, and the way they talked about it was as very kind of embodied, um, but yet still thoughtful, um, but also quite, you know, playfully. So all of that was kind of, you know, there in the mix. And so then in our partnership, we have arrived at Traces. And this is a project that is funded this time by an ESRC uh, Impact Acceleration Award, which we uh, received via, the, uh, via Cardiff University. And um, what we'd like to do at this stage is to have a look at the trailer, and then Ali's going to pick up the thread, or the traces, if you like, and, um, yeah, and talk about the partnership in a bit more detail. This is the beginning, and not the end. The beginning of something that could be nothing, or nothing that could be something. The only way to know is to follow the path down towards the tunnel. When you read 
reach the other side. Stand and wait at the junction that overlooks the two ponds. So Traces is not an audio guide, nor is it a tourist guide. It is a site-specific storytelling audio app that takes partic participants on a physical journey around St. Fagans, framing the space through narrative and composition. Meandering between fact and fiction, past and present, it is an, arti an, an artistic interpretation which challenges visitors to experience St. Fagans in a new way. Described as a mix of storytelling, game and meditation, it is both playful and thoughtful. So there are a number of ways of experiencing traces uh, on one's own, on the single person, fully accessible route, or via the partner experience, which takes participants on two separate journeys that interweave in waves that are expressly performative, but invisible to other visitors. Or alternatively, you can do either of those routes via the Welsh language um, version, which is called Olion. So through the app, we are in encouraging people to play and most crucially for a museum to touch, to see differently, to feel, to perform their visitation in new ways and perhaps more purposefully, to be implicated in the narrative and to be comfortable with that, yet not too comfortable, to end their experience with their relationship with the space shifted, altered, reimagined. So um, as a company, we um, engage, we help other organizations engage um, with new audiences and existing audiences in different ways than they're normally used to. So we were really excited about developing this project in partnership with Cardiff University and the National Museum of Wales to see how we could transform the way that we think about heritage engagement and test a new kind of approach to digital in this setting. So we started the project with a workshop with the staff at St. Baggins to understand key information that would inform what we made. At the beginning of any partnership, this is a really good idea. Often it's, it's really difficult to do, but it, it's really key in getting everybody on board and having input into the project at the very start. And in this case, the museum were experts in knowing what stories they had to tell and the extent of their archives and their capacity and staff time and also knowing who their audiences are and who they wanted to engage with in the future. And I guess our role as a creative company was to interpret, curate and challenge. And this partnership had the added value of working with Jenny Kidd from Cardiff University who brought research pertinent to the project in areas of audience behavior, gaming constructs and empathy. So from this initial workshop, we discovered that St. Baggins was not only a museum space, it was also a place where people felt safe, reflective, a space for families, dog walkers, and the like. And St. Baggins were keen to attract new audiences and at the same time give existing audiences a way to see the site through new eyes. And finally, the staff wanted um, something to be made that was fun. Not that they don't make fun things, but they kind of felt that if we were going to do a project with a partnership, let's make it fun. That's what everybody wants. And um, the final thought from the, the staff were that they wanted the project to run by itself due to the capacity um, at the time at St. Fagans. So our process when we approach um, projects is, is pretty simple. This is kind of a, a really basic chart to show how we, we start a project. So we try to define and develop four main areas, story, audience, location, and mechanic before we build and iteratively test and then launch and then you know, shout about it. So with this project, we defined the following. For the audience, the workshop had given us our target audience, new visitors, particular people aged between 20 to 35 that um, St. Fagans were sort of having trouble to engage with successfully. And ideally looking um, at maybe engaging existing audiences and giving them a new offering. Um, in terms of location, we decided to look at um, the gardens and the castle on the site, which is an area less explored by visitors. And then um, mechanic, what we mean by mechanic is the way we can tell our stories, the devices that we use. Is it analog, analog or digital or is it both? Is it replayable is it, or is it a one-time happening? Does it use game constructs or theatrical devices? 
So after considering everything we had found out in the workshop, we uh, tested a few options and we decided to create a subtle mob audio experience. So subtle mobs are usually quite pervasive um, and they usually happen in public places. Um, so they're not sort of flash mobs, they're curated experiences, but it's all about trying to remain invisible within that environment that you're in. So we thought it would be interesting to apply this to a heritage setting as it would enable us to create an immersive experience that was controlled to some extent. And it would be something that could run itself and that we really wanted the technology not to drive the experience. So in the way that Pokemon Go does, you rely on having information given to you and you are looking at the screen and content is being drawn often from other sources. So we wanted to keep it simple and challenge established behaviors of mobile phone use. So once you have the app running, you put it in your pocket and we want you to engage the space around you and see the things that we are pointing out within the narrative. Um, and in that sense, then the experience itself becomes and the technology becomes invisible. Um, and we decided really on that the app needed to be a closed app. And that means once it's downloaded, all the content is on your phone. So you don't have to rely on any external data, uh, which was pretty important because St. Baggins has zero Wi-Fi or anything like that. So that was uh, part of the brief that we had to kind of uh, do a workaround. But well, what a closed app also actually does as well, it allows um, the maintenance of the app to be really minimal and updates because we don't rely on third party data. You know, it's, it's kind of all in there. So that kind of cut out any extra cost in the future that would be unforeseen. Um, so I guess with our work, particularly, we're interested in ways which we can connect people in different ways to each other as well as to space. And we talked a lot about creating round the campfire moments of telling and sharing stories. And we talked about, could this app be the campfire for St. Fagans, encouraging people to listen to the stories it has to tell, but allow them to go on and tell their own stories of that particular experience. So what um, we have termed the froth of the experience afterwards, the legacy of that experience. So then in terms of story, we started um, researching the archives. And there's a lot of information in those archives. Um, and we explored the space and the place and sort of lived with it for a, a few weeks. And we realized quite soon on that the project shouldn't really replicate the information or the content that St. Cathagans already has because they do that really well. They curate those pieces really well. So what we could offer um, within the partnership was creating something different, an artistic interpretation based on aspects of the stories of the archives rather than a factual representation or interpretation of them. So we worked with a writer called Sarah Lewis, and we spent a long time at St. Fagans exploring the concept and themes further. And from this framework, we began drafting the narrative script, which we edited through an iterative process and discovered further inspiration from the staff at St. Fagans. I've got to give a shout out to Andrew from the gardens, who was amazing, um, had amazing stories to tell about not only the people and the history in the space, but the gardens itself, the flowers, how it changed during the seasons. Um, maybe knowledge and access to a person that members of the public wouldn't normally have. Um, we worked then with composer Jack Paul, and we added layers of composition to the narrative that would end up being just as much a part of the, the storytelling of the piece as in itself as the spoken word. So the music is composed to reflect pace and mood and emotion, and also as a, a, a device for us to help people move through the space because we're telling you to go pretty much left and right. Um, and when we want you to move quickly, the composition will, will fasten and slow as and when we need you to move um, in, in, in certain ways. Um, and then we worked with technology partner Hoffi, who designed the technical and visual aspects of the app itself. And I guess what we've created is something quite cin cinematic, um, framing sync baggins through a different lens. Um, sometimes you're the listener, sometimes an invisible actor or the central person in a fragmented and fleeting narrative, the figure at the gilded gate, pressed, face pressed towards the castle, or the girl with the buttercups in her hair. And moments come into focus and then they fade and they blur as you transition between chapters of a story told by an anonymous narrator. And there are moments where you might see yourself in the story or be implicated in it or even empathize with it, but you always remain connected to that thread. 
And I guess this is the first time that the museum has ever collaborated on a project like this. And so far, audiences have um, responded positively. We've done a sort of soft, quiet launch this year just to see what the appetite is um, before we do a proper launch next year. And people have described Traces as an experience that reveals fragments of memories in the space and is a mindful journey that allows you to discover the beauty in the landscape. So building on the previous project that Jenny um, spoke about with New Eyes I See, this enabled us as a partnership to understand how public institutions can work with partners within the creative economy. And this can be quite scary um, because we're journeying through really unmarked territory and we're creating our own signposts often. And this can be challenging for some institutions who have to break from embedded and inherited traditions. And I guess partnerships are all about finding a common language and being generous with ideas and understanding that you can actually learn from each other. And what I've learned is that there will always be um, what I will call the, the, with a capital T, panic moment in these projects, always with clients, um, because we're asking you to take risks and we're challenging um, a process and your process. Um, but we're encouraging you to think differently and therefore trust plays a massive role in partnerships. But everybody must realize we're all working towards the same goal. And I guess there's something to be said for working with people that you like. That does actually really help. Um, and I've met some amazing people through Traces, and there are some who I would actually consider invaluable mentors and friends. And it's also enabled me as an individual um, in my creative practice to be seconded to the university uh, for two days a week for four months next week to look at the impact of this project and develop my own, um, my own um, personal um, career um, pathway, which is um, something I never thought I'd do. So thank you, Jenny Kidd. Um, so takeaways. Um, yeah, do you know what? Keep it simple. If you are dipping your toe into these immersive experiences or digital experiences or however you want to call them, uh, the old adage, adage that simple ideas are always the best definitely rings true. Um, and don't be phased by the latest IT technology. Um, the amount of times I hear people say, oh, we want to do a VR project. But why do you want to do a VR project? Is it, that, is it because the technology is there? You have to ask yourself, where is your, what is your story? Who is your audience? And does that technology then enable you to enhance the telling of that story? Don't start with technology first. It, it will never really work well. Um, be clear about your audiences. Who are they? And remember that you can't make something for everyone. That's impossible. So be brave and be clear about who you want to target. And it's OK that you are targeting specific people, not everyone. If you do get everyone, that's amazing. But you know that's kind of really rare. And I would say start conversations rather than broadcasting your content. The way that we think about digital and media, the way that we browse the internet, the way that we flick through Facebook, it's transient. So how can you um, develop stories that fit those behaviors and those patterns of behaviors. And think about ways that you can give an experience of your brand and of your organization. These will grow fruitful conversations within your audiences and allow them to develop their own stories. Make it relevant to your audience and to them. And if you can, give audiences agency. It gives them ownership of that content. It allows them to move through the story with you. And in this way, again, you can start growing unique relationships with your audiences. It also, and I guess with Traces, what we've done, it allows um, us to give people permission to move through the space in a different way that they normally would. We do take you down that little pathway that you wouldn't normally go. We do get you to stand by a tree and look up, which you know we don't often do in our, in our everyday lives. Don't be scared, take risks. Um, and think about how your partnerships can lead you to unexpected and magical places if you let them. And um, my final thing is, if you build it, they won't come. Make sure that you have a really solid marketing strategy in place to tell people about what you make. Um, because just because it, it, it is digital and it's online doesn't mean people are going to necessarily find it. Um, and finally, go and play. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.